Good day students, welcome to MathGodServe.com. In this clip we're going to be going over part 4, problems 16 through 20 of the Algebra 2 Tree Regents exam for June 2015. Alright, let's take a look at problem 16. It says, which transformation of y equals fx moves the graph 7 units to the left and 3 units down? So one thing you want to remember is that for horizontal trans, uh, translations, left or right, the sign is actually the opposite of the indicated transformation or movement, all right? So if we have seven units to the left, the left is the negative x direction, right? So you might think, oh, it's going to be x minus seven, but for the horizontal movement, um, it's going to be the opposite. So seven units left is going to be the transformation y equals f of x plus, not minus, plus 7, okay? So keep that in mind. But for the uh, vertical trans translations, up or down, you keep the sign of the direction, okay? So 3 units down, down is in the direction of the negative y, okay? And the impact on the transformed function is y equals f of x minus 3, all right? So for x direction, you do the opposite, and then for the y direction, you you just keep the direction of the trans translation, okay? All right, so the combined transformation, we just unite these two together um, to get a function that's shifted seven units left and three units down. So we have y equals f of x plus seven. That means seven units to the left minus three, which means it's three units down. So our answer is option number one. All right, now let's take a look at uh, problem 17 involves solving a logarithmic equation. So before we start, just uh, something you want to recall, some facts. Um, first of all is that the sum of two logarithmic expressions with the same base is equal to the log of the product of the logarithmic arguments, okay? The product property of logarithms. And you also have the inverse property, a to the log base a of x is equal to x. This is the inverse property of logarithms. We're going to be using these two for problem 17, all right? Okay, so let's go ahead and solve this equation, this logarithmic equation, log base x equals 2 log a plus log b. Now, first thing we, we're going to do is um, we're going to power this up right here, this uh, coefficient. We're going to power it up. Why are we powering it up? Because we want to have two log uh, logarithmic expressions with the same base without any coefficients, all right? So we power this up. So we have log base 10, which is the invisible base, equals log base 10 of a square plus log base 10 of a log base 10 of b. All right. So now we can use this property right here of uh, the product property. Notice you, you want to have the logs first before you combine them. Okay. So now that we have that, we can combine them. We have log of x equals, now using the product property, we have log a squared times b, not plus. Okay, be careful with that. Um, product becomes, I mean, sum becomes product. All right, so now let's eliminate the logs. Um, the base here is 10. So using the inverse property of logarithms, I can exponentiate both sides using 10 as my basis of exponentiation of log base 10 of x equals 10 to the log base 10 of a squared times b. So I basically exponentiated both sides using 10. Why? Because that's the inverse of log base 10 that cancels out nicely on both sides. And that leaves us with x equals a square b. That's our final answer. Option number one. So it's really beneficial to remember your uh, properties of logarithms. Okay, let's take a look at problem 18. It says, which value is in the, the domain of the function graph below, but not in its range? Okay, so don't forget domain 
is your horizontal span. Okay, how far to the left do you go? How far to the right do you go? All right. And then the range is your vertical span. How high can you go? And how low can you go? All right. So domain is along the axis, of course, left, right. And range is along the y's, up and down. All right, so with that in mind, let's take a look at the graph we have here. Let's start with the domain because we want to look at what's in the domain that's not in the range. So domain, we are going to project our entire graph onto um, the x-axis. So you notice that this graph is defined from here all the way to here. So our domain or the horizontal span of the graph basically spans the entire width of this coordinate system. So it goes, uh, this is zero right here, negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, all the way to, let's mark the other side, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine all the way to nine okay so that's your domain domain is the um the horizontal span of your graph so from there to there from negative four all the way to nine all right so let's go ahead and write that in inequality notation so your domain is a set of all numbers from negative four all the way to nine all right how about the range the range, we're going to project the graph onto the y-axis, okay? So you take the maximum, project it right there. Where's the minimum? Right here, project it right there. So that vertical span is your, um, is your range, okay? So your range is going from here all the way to there. All right, so that's your range. Okay, so what is our range here? Our range, we're now looking at the y, goes from negative 2. That's the lowest y value. You see it right here? That's the lowest y value. Remember how low can you go? From negative 2 all the way up to negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. That's the maximum. Okay, so this is your, this is your range right here. All right, the vertical span of your graph. So if my graph goes from two to, uh, from negative two, less than or equal to y, less than or equal to four. All right, now that we know our domain and range, let's go ahead and answer this question. Which number is inside this interval that's not in this interval out of all these options here? Zero is in here and is also in here. 3 is definitely in here and is also in here. 2, oh man, that's close. It's at the boundary point. It's at the lower end point of the range, but it's clearly at the interior of the domain. But 7 is not in the range, but in the domain. Okay, so our answer is option number 4. These ones are not the answers because they're clearly in or at the boundary point of the these two um, intervals here. All right, let's take a look at number 19. It says, how many full cycles of the function y equals 3 sine x appear in pi radians? Okay, so if you think about a full cycle, one full cycle is a period, okay? There's one period. And you remember what the what the, a complete period of the sine function looks like, right? It basically looks like an S for a complete period or a cycle. So you go from the center going up to the max, back down. That's a complete cycle right there, okay? So the length is the period. So um, here we have the length of pi radians. So the question is how many of these complete cycles do we have within the pi radians here? So all we have to do is find the period of this function, okay? So to do that, let's write down the general form. We have y equals a sine 
b x and then we can have plus c over here so do you remember the formula for a period period is simply determined by computing 2 pi over b okay so in this problem we can clearly see that our b is 2 why because that's the coefficient of x you see that right there the coefficient of x um, is b so 2 pi over b is going to be 2 pi over 2 which is equal to pi so this is how long our our period is all right so how many pies are there in pi there's just one pi in pi okay so number of cycles in pi is simply given by the period over pi right so um, I'm sorry I meant to say um, pi over the period okay pi over the period because we're looking for how many periods in pi so pi over the period is pi the same length so the answer is one okay exactly the same measure so answer is option number one all right let's look at uh, number 20 it reads a theater has 35 seats in the first row each row has four more seats than the row before it. Which expression represents the number of seats in the nth row? Okay, so think about this nth row. Think about it as the nth term. The nth term of what? Nth term of an arithmetic sequence. Okay, how do I know that this is an arithmetic sequence? Because it's the growth rate is additive for more what is more more means you add okay you keep adding four over and over again so in essence this is an arithmetic sequence problem that's written in um in a story format okay so do you remember the formula for the nth term of an arithmetic sequence the formula is a n equals the first term what do you start what you start with plus number of terms minus one times the common difference d okay in this problem um you're starting with 35 seats on row number one a1 is 35 okay n is the number of seats we're looking for number of rows sorry so n is all is just n because we're looking for number of seats in the nth row all right um let's see common difference is how many how many more seats does a row have more than the row before it you have four more seats you add for every time so your common difference is d all right now if we plug in these values into our nth term formula that will give us the desired results so we have a1 which is 35 <laughs> 35 plus n which is n minus one times the common difference of four. All right, so our answer is option number four. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this presentation. We really appreciate it. Um, if you found this tutorial beneficial to you, please give us a thumbs up. We'll appreciate the positive feedback. Um, do not forget to subscribe to our channel for updates to the remainder of this review series. If you have any questions or like clarifications on any of these problems, please post a comment in the comment section below and we'll address it as soon as possible. More clips can be found on mathgoodserve.com under test prep. Thanks again for watching and have a wonderful day.